Please join me in welcoming Dr. Nolan Gasser. Thank you very much, Jennifer. And it is just a true delight to be here in our new reality of Zoom lectures. <laughs> uh, I've given many, many Zoom presentations, but not in, fr in front of such a distinguished group. So I am very excited to be here. So indeed, I'm going to share my screen and uh, give you a little discussion about uh, the story of your musical taste. Obviously, this is based on the book, Why You Like It. So normally when I get uh, started with this, uh, I ask for a, a show of hands of who loves music. Uh, since I can't see your hands, uh, I have, but of course I have no doubt that you are raising it if I were to ask that question. Uh, it's a bit of a trick question anyway, because I know that we all love music. Um, we are all hardwired to love music, which is what we will be talking about today. But um, the next question would be, what kind of music do we, do we love? Because I do know that we all love different styles of music. So the next question is, what music do you love? Maybe you love the cool jazz of Miles Davis. <laughs> Or the electro pop of Lord. Quartet by Dmitry Shostakovich. <laughs> I can't see you. I don't really know what our age demographic is, uh, so <laughs> I would have a hard time guessing. But maybe you might like something a little bit less familiar, maybe an original composition based on a painting by Piet Mondrian called Broadway Boogie Woogie by yours truly.
all right. Oh, please. No, no, that, that's quite all right. <laughs> it definitely a strange experience to be giving a lecture and a virtual performance. Uh, obviously, I do give this talk a fair bit, or I should say I did prior to our current circumstances and would naturally uh, have a piano next to me, uh, which I actually do. It's that same keyboard you see here in my studio. Normally, it's, an, it's a beautiful acoustic instrument. Um, but also I've got uh, that and one more performance for you later on, um, since it's not quite the same as in a live hall. All right, so the question would be, which of those uh, did you like or do you love? Um, maybe you like all, all four styles, maybe just one or two. Um, but um, regardless, I certainly know that there is some music that you do love, since as I said, everybody loves music. Well, actually, not everybody. There is a condition known as amusia, which actually affects up to 4% of the population, which for one reason or another, by birth or by an accident, there's an apathy or an indifference and aversion even to music. Music even can sound like pots and pans banging against the, against the floor, in the words of one of the patients of Oliver Sacks, those poor souls. Um, of course, I'm sure that nobody in attendance uh, today uh, has this condition, but it may explain why that uncle of yours uh, is tone deaf or why a coworker of yours uh, can't dance. But again, it's a pretty small portion of the population uh, that is affected with this condition. Um, and thus, we can really return to our original statement, uh, maybe modified a bit. We almost all love music. So the next, that's good. But the question next is, why do we love music? And as well as, where does our taste for music come from? Where does our musical taste come from? Well, uh, that's the topic that we'll be exploring, of course, in this talk. So first, just a little bit more about, uh, about me. As Jennifer mentioned a little bit, I am a pianist, as you hear. I am a composer, and I am a musicologist. And indeed, uh, published last year, I wrote this book. If you have a copy or if you've seen a copy, you know it's not a pithy little pamphlet. It's a pretty, uh, a pretty hefty tome. There's a lot to say about music. Um, at least a lot. I had a lot to say about musical taste. Took me a good while um, uh, to write it, about three years. But as I like to say, in many ways, it was a whole lifetime in the making. Um, in the preface of the book, I recount a story that when I was in my 20s, I lived in Paris. Uh, a buddy of mine uh, and I sold all of our belongings in California and moved out to Paris. And I studied composition and drank red wine and played in jazz clubs. And we had a circle of friends, obviously some expats uh, from the US, as well as uh, some local Parisians. And uh, we would have different soirees at different people's houses. And one, one night, uh, after a few bottles of good bo of, 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 of Beaujolais, a girl stood up and said, I'm going to play a game. I'm going to go around the room and uh, sort of give everybody a literary genre that their personality is akin to. So my friend Glenn, who was an aspiring novelist, she said, you're, you're uh, a, a, a roman a novel. Another girl she assigned a haiku. Well, that's pretty nice. She looked at me and she stared a while and she said, I got it. You're an encyclopedia. And I was a little bit, you know, hurt. I was sort of the one active artist. I, th I thought I should have been uh, given a, a more sort of aesthetic, uh, uh, you know, sort of nom de guerre. Um, but uh, in many ways, I have to admit there was, there was and is some truth to that. I've always been interested in seeing the big picture, the story behind the story. And so again, this book in many ways is sort of a lifetime uh, in, in the works. Um, fast forward many years, the real bona fides that allowed me to write this book is my association, as Jennifer said, with Pandora Radio. I was at the right place at the right time and was able to participate in what is now referred to as the digital music revolution uh, back in the early 2000s. This was even before the iPhone. Uh, I'm the architect of the Music Genome Project. Uh, that's sort of a, a very a rigorous uh, methodology of, uh, of analysis, breaking music into individual discrete factors or genes, covering all of these different musical parameters. Um, 
when I often give this talk, it's usually like about 90 minutes with uh, lecture and, and, and performances. Obviously, this is much shorter, so we're going to skip a few sections, including the discussion on Pandora. If you're really interested, you can read all about it in uh, chapter one of, of my book. All right, so we're going to really get into the topic of musical taste. So what do we mean by musical taste? We get a little bit of a sense of this by thinking about what Mark, Mark Twain's sort of a famous quip about the music of Richard Wagner when he said that Wagner's music is better than it sounds. It's kind of a strange comment. You have to think about it for a second. How can music be, uh, be good but sound bad? Well, what this is really getting at is this broader topic of good versus bad taste. Now, this is actually an old notion, goes back to the ancient Greeks, uh, Plato and Aristotle, but it really found resonance in the 17th uh, century, uh, in the 18th century, especially with uh, philosophers like David Hume. And Hume uh, basically had the idea that in order to really understand taste required a trained kind of expert, a sort of an aesthete that could, could, that could make that sort of determination for the mere masses. And so this idea really kind of held sway. There was a, a, a musical journal, uh, an English journal in the 1830s called The Musical World that posed the question, who is the greatest composer? who is the greatest composer of all. And the writer there wrote that the best music is composed with a view of exciting in our minds the noblest emotions, namely those connected with the, with the adoration of the supreme being. And tried by this test, the greatest of all composers, you saw it now, that, they, that this author wrote is Georg Friedrich Handel. They even kind of look alike. Um, now, of course, we today look at this, this notion that there would be a greatest composer uh, as kind of a sort of absurd. We recognize that taste is subjective, uh, that it's in the ear of the beholder, as I like to say. And in many ways, this is very much an American idea. In uh, a couple decades later, there was an American journal called The Spirit of the Times. And uh, the author there was kind of responding to attacks coming from the continent that Americans were sort of, you know, uh, very base uh, characters and didn't have real taste. And so the author writes, against those who decry that there is no taste, there is no musical taste in America, I say, with music as with taste, there is no standard. It is something better felt than described. The best is unwritten, but lies scored deep in the hearts of each breathing creature. It's a very beautiful turn of phrase, really a very personal idea of taste. And this is, of course, related to the Latin idiom de gustibus non est disputandum, a lot of sort of acknowledgement back, and this is the age of the Enlightenment for, that America was founded, based on a lot of uh, Greek and, and, and Roman ideals. Uh, in matters of taste, there can be no dispute. And really, as I think we can all say, that it's only kind of, music is only good if it's good for you. So musical, musical taste is subjective. We can all agree on that. But then we can ask, okay, where does our musical taste come from? Does it come from nature or does it come from nurture? Well, obviously, um, you science fans know that it certainly has to involve nature, uh, but it certainly involves nurture as well. It's, it's of course, both. Um, and so to unwind this, and in the book, I really look pretty deep into a bunch of extra musical factors. Of course, I dive into the music itself, but I look at a bunch of hard science topics. Obviously, this is appropriate for this, for this audience. So I, for example, I look in the realm of anthropology and physics and neuroscience and even my own ideas about cell biology. And the idea is that these, by understanding the relationship between these branches of science, we can get at the collective roots, what we kind of all share in common with our musical taste. So let's get started with the realm of anthropology. So first, a little bit of context. Uh, we Homo sapiens, of course, go back quite a ways, about 200,000 years, but it was only really uh, about 75,000 years ago that we first successfully, it was our second attempt, successfully migrated out of our little corner of East Africa to conquer the world. 
And as it happens, this, this period, 75,000 years or, ago or so, corresponds to the age of what many think is the oldest surviving musical instrument. This is known as the Diwia Baba flute. It's main, made from a femur of a cave bear, was found in Slovenia. And of course, this is a pretty hard material made out of a, of, a, of a bone of a bear. And so we can only imagine how many other instruments made of wood or shells or flimsier bones that are now lost. So who knows how far back musical instruments go. And of course, before we were shredding on our, on our, on our bear flutes, uh, we were making music with our most natural instruments, our voices, the so-called singing Neanderthal. Now, the ancient origins of singing raises all kinds of interesting questions, even gnarly ones. What is the relationship between music and speech? Did we sing before we spoke? Certainly, we know that when, when you can hear me speak right now, I'm not speaking in a monotone. My voice goes up and down, up at the end of a question. Um, and so there is kind of almost a musical contour to our natural means of, of, of speech. This is a big topic I, I touch on in the book. But there's one other kind of really interesting question that I will address here. And that's the question, was music an adaptive trait? In other words, did music itself help us to become human, help us to evolve and to adapt? So it's a tricky question. It's generated lots of contradictory theories. We're not going to get into them here. But you can get a little bit of an idea by uh, understanding and exploring the, the writings and thinkings of the Harvard professor Steven Pinker, I'm sure many of you know. Um, so in 1990, Pinker wrote the book, The Language Instinct. And he talks, obviously, about the importance of language in our evolution. But when he gets to music, he asks the question, did music help us to evolve? And he says, as far as biological cause and effect are concerned, music is useless. Music appears to be pure pleasure technology, like cheesecake or pornography a cocktail of recreational drugs that we ingest through the ear to stimulate a mass of pleasure circuits at once. So let's get this right. Music is like uh, pornography and cheesecake and is sort of uh, just, uh, you know, sort of biologically useless. Well, not surprisingly, not everybody agrees with that assessment. Uh, again, it's a, it's a big debate. I explore it. I call it the big fat uh, music evolution debate. You can read all the various theories. Won't go into them, but I will give you my sense that I think there's at least three reasons that support that even if music itself, as we understand it, did not help us to evolve, I do believe that our inherent musicality our ability to be musical did help us to adapt. And I'll give you three, again, three reasons. The first of those is the notion of entrainment. Now, this is where I normally, uh, I play, and I'm gonna kind of go a little bit out of, uh, out of sight here, uh, but I'm, my piano is here. I normally kind of start playing the Stars and Stripes forever. And I have everybody clap, and then I start to slow down. People still clap with me, and then I speak So, and everybody kind of laughs and feels good and feels kind of, you know, all uh, kind of warm and fuzzy. Um, and of course, this is our ability to, to, to lock into a steady beat. And we take it for granted. We think that, well, of course we can do that. But actually, we humans are like the only species that can, that can consistently do that. There's a couple of, there's a, a parakeet or a cockatiel maybe, and there's a seal that can do it on a couple songs. But consistently and with changes and at will uh, and all that, of course, it's just humans. And really this, this ability, as I talked about, you know, when you're clapping together and you're experiencing the music and you're keeping time or you're dancing, this is sort of a way of sort of social bonding. And we all know that social bonding obviously is an adaptive uh, and sort of necessity. And so our ability to be musical and lock into it, to entrain into a beat must have been a, a, a helpful tool. The second is the, no, is the ability known as vocal coding. So that's the ability that I have, that you have, unless 
unless you has suffer from severe amusia, to uh, sing a pitch and then at will to go to a higher pitch and then back down and then to a lower pitch. Um, and again, this is uh, not, we're not the only uh, species by any means that can do this, but we obviously have a great ability to do this. And I can say, you know, my funny Valentine, sweet a, a comic Valentine, but when I sing it, my funny Valentine, sweet comic Valentine, and I'm looking you in the eye, especially if I had a nice voice, uh, this obviously must have been an adaptive trait to help us uh, find a mate or to at least get a phone number. So again, our vocal coding must have been an adaptive ability. And finally, the, the whole ability that music can have to give us chills. We all know that, or many of us experience chills when we hear music that we really love. Um, it's sort of a neurochemical reaction. It's a complex one. It actually goes back to our ability or, or our response to, to cold uh, and to other things. But it be, music, when music can give us chills, it was like a safe space to, um, uh, to train our senses. So again, that notion of uh, chills certainly must have been something to uh, help us adapt. Um, so that's a little bit about uh, music and anthropology. We're gonna next move into the realm of physics. Now, normally I say that uh, this may be the section that kind of puts you, uh, puts some of the audience a little bit uh, to, to nod off, but again, this is a science loving audience, so I'm not worried. Um, we're just gonna talk about a couple of, or uh, one main issue, main topic of, of the relationship between music and physics and the relationship to musical taste. And that that is the notion of the overtone series. Now the overtone series is a product of the fact that musical sound, as opposed to non-musical sound, say like a slamming door or uh, if I clap my hands, uh, musical sound is a wondrous thing because it automatically, just by virtue of its, its physical properties, generates harmonic overtones. So what that means is that whenever I play a single or I sing a, a musical pitch, say this low C on the piano, automatically, not by something that I'm doing, but by the physics of sound, other pitches, softer pitches, also occur at the same time above it and always in the same sequence of intervals. They, they sort of ascend by integer multiples. So two to one, three to two, four to three, five to four, and so forth. And what that amounts to are intervals that we today call, so the first one is the octave, and then the fifth, and then the fourth, and the third, major third above that, a minor third above that, another minor third a little bit flat, a second, Another second, they get a little bit smaller and smaller, not surprisingly, as we go up. Now, I know what you're saying. You're saying, okay, I heard that first note, but I don't hear any of those other notes. I don't know what you're talking about. Well, it's true that they are really hard to, to, to hear, especially over Zoom, um, but we know they exist because by virtue of the different sort of dispositions by different how loud some of the, or soft some of these overtones are. That's what makes a piano sound like a piano, a flute sound like a, pl a flute, my voice sound like it is. Every instrument, every sound creates its, its own disposition of overtones. So we know that they exist. And what's more, even more interesting is that those initial overtones, the octave, the fifth and the fourth, these are strong intervals. sounds like you know ancient Roman music. These are strong uh, intervals that really are the basis, the foundation of musical styles uh, around the world. And another factor is if we kind of go up to the, say the fifth overtone, just straight, we actually get a sound that's a little bit familiar. A C major chord in this case, if we start from C. If I continue up all the way to the eighth in uh, overtone, I get the notes of the minor chord. If I even just go up to the sixth, I get a dominant seventh chord. The point is that we didn't invent major and minor chords.
chords, God did or nature did, because they exist in the physics of sound automatically. In fact, I even can tell you that I know with some certainty that God loves jazz, because that natural dominant seventh chord is sort of the essence of jazz. All right, so what this sort of suggests, and again, this is not just this doesn't just affect those of us here in Zoom or those of us in the United States or this, 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 these are the, the elements, these are the, the structural and the active musical ingredients around the world. And because they are physical properties, we also know that they're not limited to the planet Earth. So if someday in the future we're able to travel to the Andromeda galaxy and we happen to land on a, on a Goldilocks planet and we, and we get met by, by friendly aliens and they take us to an uh, alien bar and there's a band playing, as weird as the music will sound, and I'm sure it will sound weird, I'm almost certain as well that it will contain octaves and fifths and fourths and maybe even major, minor and dominant seventh chords because again, built into the fabric of sound and their ears or their, uh, their hearing apparatus uh, would have been in, uh, sort of attuned to those as well. All right, so that's a little bit about physics. Now, none of this would matter to us. It wouldn't affect our musical taste at all if we didn't have brains that we're able to process music. But happily for us, our brains are veritable music processing machines. Listening to music activates more parts of the brain than almost any other activity. And especially if you perform music, if you sing music, your brain is just lighting up all over the place. It's really a miracle that our brains are able to perceive, organize sound, organize notes into scales, into melodies, and into harmonies, and, and, and organize rhythms into meters. Uh, and much, much more. This happens really, again, automatically. You don't need to be trained in music to be able to understand music's discourse. Uh, this happens through complex statistical rendering that our brains you know, compute from our earliest childhood, from really, from the, even in the womb, some of this begins, but certainly in the first years of life, uh, it is very active. And this enables us to understand a lot about what's going on in, the, in what we understand understand in music. So for example, the, in, the, in, the internal musical syntax, the rules by which melodies and rhythms and harmonies uh, should or should not behave as well as the various kinds of meaning, the semantics that uh, music is able to convey. Now, sometimes the, the, the meaning can be very vague, it can be a mood, it can sound happy or scary. But when we hear the Star Spangled Banner, even with no singing, that music actually has actual meaning. We certainly know that music can generate strong emotions. It's one of the reasons why we love it is because we feel so passionate toward it, uh, the music that we love, and we feel such disdain for the music that we don't. And most complex of all is memory. And again, I go into a lot of this into the book. I found memory one of the most uh, interesting topics. There's a lot of study on music and memory. Um, so if you want to learn more about that, I would recommend that you read that, that chapter. Um, so, um, in, so how does memory manifest itself? Well, let's say, for example, that you were to go to a concert and somebody were to play an arrangement of a song that you know, say, All I Ask of You from Phantom of the Opera your memory would be kicking in on multiple le levels. You'd be paying attention to the musicological content. Your memory would be registering, okay, that's all I ask of you. I know that song. I, I recognize that melody uh, and those harmonies and, that, and that, those kinds of rhythms. Uh, but then you'd also be making uh, an awareness of, okay, well, this is an interesting arrangement. It's not for voice. It's for solo piano, for example, and doing some interesting things with the harmony. So you'd be mapping both your memory of the concrete a song as well as the more flexible arrangement. You'd maybe be, would be thinking and, and aware of the, of the historical content that this was from the musical Phantom of the Opera. It was uh, written by Andrew Lloyd Webber in 1986. Maybe you saw it in London back when we could see musicals. Um, 
and you'll think about your own biographical context. You, uh, you listen, you first heard this, you know, when you were young, you were a student, or you just heard it last week when you got into a fight with your friend or whatever it might be. Um, and of course, the emotional content that would be uh, in, in, all those con in all those kinds of contexts. Now, normally at this point in my, in my uh, lecture con slash concert, I actually do an arrangement of all I ask of you, but in the interest of time, we're going to forego this. Uh, so my apologies, or uh, maybe you're, 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 you're welcome. Um, but we do have one more performance for you. All right, so one final realm of science, and this is a bit of a stretch. This is a, I readily admit it's sort of a metaphorical connection, uh, and that is the realm of cell biology. Um, and this comes out of my sort of realization, my, uh, you know, awareness in my own mind of some really strong connections between some basic processes of cell biology and inherent constant universal techniques of music. I, many years ago, I gave a lecture at the Gladstone Institute in San Francisco, uh, and I was on the same um, dais as a man named Shinya Yamanaka, who won the Nobel Prize for his work in stem cell uh, work. Uh, so I knew that going in, and I didn't want to look e even more stupid than, uh, than I would if I didn't think about it beforehand. So I did a little bit of, of study, and I, that's when I first began to recognize some of these things, and I have since uh, made hay about it. Um, so let me just jump to a couple of conclusions uh, that I've drawn, and you can see if you think this is a, a reasonable metaphor connection. So we begin with the fact that we humans, of course, begin life as a single cell, uh, a single cell, a zygote, um, that quickly divides into two symmetrical daughter cells, the process of mitosis. And this replication, this, this duplication uh, happens continually as we developed. It's, that's the way that our DNA is replicated and happens uh, where we now, as adults, we have some 40 trillion cell, cells, all from this single, um, uh, single cell zygote. Um, all right, that's one fact, one thing to keep in mind. The other is the fact that pretty soon in our development, still in the womb, of course, uh, our cells start to develop uh, sort of differ di di differentiation uh, as pluripotent uh, stem cells. So some of these cells turn into, uh, you know, cardiac muscle cells uh, or uh, brain neuron cells, red blood cells, and so forth. Again, all deriving from that same uh, single cell zygote. These are, in essence, uh, variation on a theme, which of course, is a musical notion. Now, musicians, of course, were never thinking about cell biology, uh, not since high school. Uh, but again, these same, some of these techniques uh, that I think are related are in the music that they're making. So there's, there's four that I will highlight. The first is repetition. We talked about how the cell division happens and the cell, the DNA replicates continually. Well, musical replication, musical repetition is an absolute mainstay, much more than in really any other art form, more than even in obviously in speech uh, or in painting, um, for example. But you take a song like this. wouldn't be the same song if that didn't repeat, right? So uh, that's one. The second is motivic development. So much as if as these embryonic stem cells sort of develop, this, this, this uh, initial cells develop into and differentiate into different kinds of cells. So music often, uh, in various ways, uh, carries out a process of sort of development and a theme is presented and then it's changed, it's, it's adapted. A famous example, of course, would be, right, so that's the original zygote, right, and then it, but then it keeps developing. So all of that and much, much more from, you could say, from, from that original zygote. 
A third is, which we've already talked about, is the notion of variation. Again, these stem cells vary into all different kinds of cells and different cell functions. Well, variation, again, is, a, is an absolute, it's not just theme in variations, but variation is a mainstay of music making. Uh, you take jazz, for example, a jazz musician may play a simple version uh, of the melody of, say, Blue Skies by Irving Berlin. <laughs> So variation, which happens continually in music, of course. And finally, there is symmetry. You can even look at that, uh, that image of the zygote. It splits into two symmetrical daughter cells. Well, musical balance and symmetry, of course, is not just music that partakes in, uh, in symmetry. It's a mainstay of all of so much art. But you take something like... It's a phrase which is then balanced... Which kind of makes us that sort of a satisfying whole. All right, so I go into much more detail if you are interested in the book, but there's a little sense of uh, how, um, how, how uh, cell biology, on some metaphorical sense, plays a role. All right, so obviously, there, these things give us a sense of our overall collective musical taste. To dive into closer to our individual taste, we need to begin to explore some other things. In the book, of course, I go into great detail of the realm of musical theory, which uh, may make you say, you know, quote Dante, lasciate ogni speranza voi che entrante, uh, from, uh, from, from, from Inferno, abandon all hope, you who enter. It's actually not that bad. I try to make... Um, uh, music theory palatable for a, a lay audience. No, no musical training is necessary. Um, and in many ways, I approach it by coming back to the Music Genome Project, breaking uh, music theory into a lot of the key elements. Now, in this talk, in the interest of time, we're going to bypass that, uh, but that's all at the ready in the book. But we can continue down the path towards our individual musical taste by moving towards the soft sciences. So we've talked about science and the collective musical taste. Now we go into sociology, the soft sciences of culture. I call intraculture, which is like subcultures and psychology. And as we go further and further into these, we move from the, and which of course I should say, psychology, I explore emotion as well as personality. And these take us from the collective to the individual uh, realms um, of our musical taste. So starting a little bit of a quick tour of this, we go into culture. Um, so our ability to kind of understand, say, 4-4 four, four meter and improvisation and syncopation and, and major and minor chords, whether you know them from a theory standpoint, you kind of understand them uh, pretty naturally if you were raised in the West um, because you've been exposed to this music uh, so over your lifetime. It's not very, it's not very unusual. Um, but if you were raised in a small village in India or in Indonesia, a major chord or a, a jazz improvisation or the sound of a clarinet might be a little bit odd. Uh, whereas things that would be normal would be things like microtones. That's the notes between the notes of the, of the piano or unusual instruments to our, to our uh, Western ears. This process of having things sound normal or, or, or weird is known as enculturation. Uh, and it really begins right again early on in, in our development uh, through statistical uh, um, uh, codification um, and statistical um, things. Uh, we're able to make these rules about how harmonies and melodies and, uh, perf uh, uh, perform and, and uh, what, in what in instruments are sort of typical uh, for use. Um, 
And, you know, we don't get, we don't need to, to do anything. We get this simply by listening to the radio, watching a dance show, going to a club, uh, going to a concert, even being at the dentist office or being in an elevator. We're constantly hearing this music uh, and we're being, uh, we're being enculturated into our native culture. Um, the, the window of, of enculturation is pretty open for the first year of our development where we can kind of follow rules almost in every in any culture but by the end of that first year the window kind of starts to close and um, uh, we really begin to hear music as being our music um, as opposed to for example if we hear if we in the raised in the west hear music from us uh, in from A hard time being able to predict where that melody goes or try to find the beat in this Bulgarian folk dance. <laughs> Right. Now, that's going to be easy and natural and enculturated by people that grow up listening to this music. But if you didn't grow up, again, uh, it, that's not... And if you don't understand it, it doesn't mean that you're not going to like it. You may love that. Uh, the, the, the vocal technique of Nusrat Fata Ala Khan, uh, who you heard sing that Pakistani piece, uh, is really incredible. But if, you, if it's unfamiliar, it's going to be a little bit harder to get to the point of loving it. Um, all right, so our musical, uh, and I should say that really what this means, we'll be hearing it, uh, we, we may love it, but even if we do love it, we'll be hearing it with an accent. We won't be hearing it as we hear our native, our native, um, our native music. So our musical taste gets seeded by our native culture, almost like an anchor set on a vast seafloor of musical possibilities. It then gets fine-tuned by the many communities, cliques, groups, subcultures, what I call intracultures, uh, within uh, our dominant culture. And this is now where musical taste starts to get a little bit more fine-tuned. Sociologists refer to markers. These are our sort of our financial status, our, our education, uh, our, uh, our dress, and especially uh, our various hobbies, the things that we are naturally inclined to through exposure and through our own, uh, our own sensibilities. Um, and even though we become, we, we join these various intracultures and we're all members of many, many, and they all have their own musical uh, identity. And some, in some of them, music plays a big role, like in, 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 uh, in, in sort of national and in, in identity, uh, that plays a big role. Um, certain, whatever school you go to, whatever hobbies you're involved in, there will be, or dress, there'll be a certain musical uh, element. Um, but all of these also, of course, have a relationship to the overall mainstream, right, the dominant culture. And in many ways, that's how Mark Twain knew that uh, Wagner's music was better than it sounds. The mainstream told him so. It's how we know that Bruce Springsteen is the boss or that Aretha Franklin uh, was the queen of soul or Beyonce is the queen bee. doesn't mean that we'll necessarily like this music, but the fact that the mainstream is 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 touting them, we kind of feel almost a certain pressure uh, to at least be aware of them, or maybe we should like them. But within our intracultures, these become our groups. And so it's by virtue of the affinity that we have with these groups, and especially our hobbies, that if we're part of a group and, and uh, we feel really close to the, to the people in it, and somebody says, hey, you should try this, you try listening to this piece of music, you're already somewhat already predisposed to like it. It doesn't mean that you will, but more so than if somebody who's in, who uh, is not in, uh, or someone, if, from someone from outside of any of your intracultures say, here, try this, you may be less inclined to like it. So our, um, it's by virtue of our many intracultures that we start to gain our unique musical identity. They give us access, they give us permission, but they're not the final arbiter. That last mile is our, of course, is our psychology. It's a big topic. Music studies are huge in, in psychology today, as I mentioned, especially in emotion uh, and in personality. No two people, of course, uh, are alike. No two share the top 
the same top 10 in music, not even you and your twin, if you have one, uh, and really as well it should be. Our, the music that we love, especially music that we grow up with uh, in our teens, uh, in our early 20s, this is the soundtrack of our identity. It's how we forge our identity uh, and the various emotions that are associated with the songs that we hear um, really help to build our, our sense of self. Um, so as I mentioned, we have the realm of emotion, uh, and there's kind of two main points of discussion here. There's the, the kind of emotion that uh, a piece of music, uh, we will perceive in a, in a piece of music, the music will sound happy, it will sound sad, it will sound scary. And then there's the uh, emotion that we ourselves feel that is induced by the music that'll make us feel happy, make us feel sad or or scared, and they're often aligned. You know, when we go to a horror movie and the music is in, you know, sounds scary, we feel scared, but not always. <laughs> Music, this music obviously sounds happy. It's in major, it's in you know, nice, easy tempo, it's got the boom check. But for if you're like me, that does anything but make you happy. So um, obviously the, the, the relationship of music and emotion is a, is a complex one. Uh, the next uh, main topic is personality, and this obviously gets us closer to the relationship of musical taste. Uh, what kind of personality do we have, and how does this actually manifest with uh, our musical taste? There's all kinds of models, My uh, Myers-Briggs, Rorschach, Inkblot, uh, many others. The one that's used uh, especially uh, in, in music is known as the big five. Um, so our ocean, sometimes it's, it's uh, referred to the different of openness to, ex uh, to experience, conscientious, agreeable, neurotic, which doesn't mean like a little, uh, a little messed up. It actually just means, you know, pr more prone to be kind of sullen and solitary as opposed to um, being, being, being an extrovert. So lots of studies on the relationship between uh, if you are, you take one of these tests, you take the big five uh, uh, test and you are your dominant uh, trait is open to experience well that might mean that you are uh, you know a, a fan of classical music or if you're more extroverted you're a fan of hip-hop um, obviously pretty simple another uh, gauge that's often used by music psychologists is known as cognitive style, which is divided up in between people that are more empathizing, uh, in other words, they really feel the, the emotions of others as opposed to more systematizing. They, they experience the world by putting things in different categories. And depending on where you fall there, you may be uh, prone to uh, like certain kinds of music more than, more than others. All right, so what are the actual relationships between psychology and musical taste. Well, as I mentioned, uh, there is a correlation that if you're more open to experience, uh, you may be a fan of classical or jazz or world. If you're more extroverted, you're a fan, maybe you're more likely to be a fan of rock, electronica, and hip hop. Uh, or with the correlation of uh, the cognitive style. If you're more empathizing, you listen to music for, to kind of uh, regulate your emotions. Um, whereas if you're more systematizing, you maybe use it as background while you're studying. Um, so these are interesting, but I think you'll agree that they are a little bit simplistic uh, and that we really kind of need to find more complex correlations. And so in the book, I talk about a bigger basket of musical factors, not just our personality and our cognitive style, but our emotional profile, our musical training, the context in which we listen to music, and what I call our musical genotype. That is the kinds of musicological things that we gravitate toward. Do we gravitate towards certain kinds of harmonies or certain kinds of rhythms more than others, which is really what Pandora was trying to get at. So what I do in the book is I kind of take um, people through kind of different, uh, sort of a day in the life of seven different music lovers who are really prone to especially love one of these uh, different species of music, rock, hip hop, world, jazz, electronica, and classical through five different contexts, a morning workout, a drive to work, a drive from work, out with friends and ready for bed. For the classical uh, lover, um, 
I picked these pieces. So for the morning workout, you've got core meat of the So maybe you'd listen to a piece by Antonio Vivaldi. And then you're coming back from work. You've had a long day. You need something to kind of clear your mind. So you listen to music of Beethoven from the Symphony Number no. 7, the Allegretto. Then finally you're out with friends and you, or not penultimately, you're out with friends and so you go to a concert and you listen to music by Leonard Bernstein. day and then you're ready to settle down for bed and you listen to the music of Gabriel Faure, the uh, Sicilian from uh, the incidental music of Pelias and Melissa. All right, so these are just five somewhat randomly picked pieces. Obviously, I did it with some intentionality. And in the book, again, there are seven music lovers, five pieces of music. So that gave me an excuse to talk in depth about 35 pieces of music to really learn about what's going on from an historical and a musicological standpoint. But okay, so let's say that that was a music lover and they, they love those five pieces. What does that say? It kind of gives you a sense that they love sort of war horses, that they love pieces that have a strong rhythmic drive, that have sort of a sophisticated harmony, not too much dissonant. They love complex form uh, and, and unpredictable forms. They love sonic contrast, pedal points, and moderate amount of counterpoint. From the psychological dimensions, we can relate that this is uh, people that have an, are open to experience and conscientious. They are mixed style, both um, uh, em uh, empathizing and systematizing. They have an emotional profile of high arousal, negative balance. In other words, they, they almost have a, a certain love of melancholy, but uh, positive death, things that are sophisticated. They probably have some musical training and they like to listen to music to uh, enhance concentration for solitary listening as well as what I call aesthetic listening, listening just to kind of have an emotional and, and aesthetic experience. The point being, uh, five songs is obviously way too little uh, to understand somebody's musical taste. But as you understand your own personality, how you fit on, on these kind of various factors and the music that you love, you'll begin to get this correlation of understanding your musical taste. All right, so in the, in the minute or so that I have left, um, the question may be, well, why does all of this matter? Why, why do we need to know what our musical taste is? Well, it's because we are so hardwired to love music, uh, and music uh, in many ways has the ability, because it does activate the brain so much, it can have such a positive impact on us, on us. It can lower our heart rate, our blood pressure, and especially if we engage with the listening experience. Um, if we empower our musical taste to at least from time to time, um, you to put on music, put the headphones on, and find a piece of music that we love and really just sit with it. Follow the musical discourse in real time. This is where we really get the power of music. And the more that we understand our musical taste, where it comes from, uh, its impact on us, the more that we can uh, have uh, this kind of benefit. Um, I've, in my studies of music therapy, for example, I've learned that certain things 
actually can be pretty effective at in, you know enhancing uh, uh, concentration uh, and uh, even uh, provide healing, say for cancer patients. Those include pedal points when a when a, a pitch is steady against things that moved or descending uh, bass lines, as well as a lilting like a triple meter. So with those in mind, and this is how we're going to end our talk, um, I've made one last recording. And this is my recording of a piece that employs pedal points and descending bass lines, as well as a triple meter. It's six, eight meter. This is my uh, little rendition today of uh, John Lennon's uh, Norwegian Wood. say in, in the late uh, 15th uh, century, uh, a theorist named Johannes Tictoris wrote that nothing written more than 40 years ago is worth listening to. This is the beginning of the Renaissance. He was a big fan of the music of, say, of, of, of Guillaume Dufailly du, du um, at the beginning of the Renaissance, and he just dismissed everything written more than 40 years ago. But if you think about music history for many, many centuries, that really held true. Up until into the 19th century, nobody listened to music that was more than 40 years old. And if that would be to today, that would take us back to 1980. It was the good year, but it wasn't the last good year. Thanks to services like Pandora and Spotify and others, we have access to music of every year, of every culture all around the world. And it gives us the ability to enhance our musical taste, to empower our musical taste. It is our birthright. And so I welcome, invite everybody to... In, in, to in, explore your musical tastes and get, get the most out of it. Um, and with that, I say thank you very much. <laughs>